This is Leisha Holmes and I'm your host on the Recruiters Recruitment Podcast and I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined today by somebody I actually met a few years ago uh, and we've been supporting one another on social media and I'm really excited about all the different things we're going to talk about today. This is Tina Holt and she is the founder of JTHR Solutions. Welcome to you today Tina, how are you? I'm really good, thank you very much, and uh, yeah, happy to be here. It's nice to do this. It's been a while coming. Can't believe we're already here. I know we book. In, in, we, do, we do book in advance, and it very nearly didn't happen because as I record this, I'm just at the back end of laryngitis. So, <laughs> apologies for any squeakiness uh, for those listening. So, thank you for joining us. And you know, for those who are not yet familiar with you, Tina, give us a little bit of a bio as to who you are and what you do. Okay, so uh, my background has been in HR for most of my career in the recruitment sector. So I used to be a global HR director working for two of the um, biggest recruitment businesses in the Northwest. Um, One was more technical engineering, oil and gas, and the other one was predominantly oil and gas recruitment. So um, what I did in 2018 was leave my last job and set up my own HR consultancy to support the recruitment sector, but in the SME market. So looking at you know, making sure people that don't have internal HR because they don't need it or can't afford it, that they still get that level of support. Yeah, so it's basically outsourcing the HR. Now, I'm I'm of the generation because I've been in recruitment 20, 23, nearly 24 years where we were trained to avoid speaking to HR people. Uh, and I know we were just speaking off camera about that, which for me, I never subscribed to that. I always used to think, well, why are we not engaging with them? So just to give us some context about why you think HR is a vital part of a business's strategy, particularly, I mean, we both have the same audiences, it's SMEs. So give us a little bit yeah. of context around that, why it should be a priority. So it's, it, it, it's, it has changed over the years, <clears throat> definitely. I mean, it ha- used to be, I mean, I remember the days when we used to call it human remains, you know, it was just not even, it was just not on anybody's radar. We have to have it. We don't really know what we're doing with it. You know, it was like, but it wasn't really uh, seen as a crucial part of the business, but it has changed over the years. And a lot more since we had all the lockdown and, and COVID and everything, people are looking more at how they attract and retain their key talent. And they need HR to help them do that and to make sure that they've got their brand, their own brand, that they've got everything in place that they need, all the foundations they need to build and scale up the businesses um, and they, and people are starting to realise the importance of it because what it allows business leaders to do is focus on their business because they know all these things that they need to bring in, the things that they need to do, but they just haven't got the time to do it. So having HR support, whether that's internal or outsourced like what I do, they can then say, right, you do all that, hand that over to you. And then, then I am in the process with a number of my clients is, putting all the fundamentals in place with around everything. So the, uh, the, the employee value proposition around all the benefits, the culture, the values, and, and, and all the things that are important, but nobody's got time to do. Yeah. And then, and, and because we're a people business and because we're in a tough market at the moment, it's really important to focus on your people and make sure that you're retaining your good, your good, your good people and attracting really strong talent as well. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of points that, that have covered that and hopefully we will get a chance to, to cover all of those. And, you know, it's it's important that you've given that as a kind of, I guess, a footprint of where we're at. And I, I agree with you. I think that particularly over the last two years, the level of importance that both companies and employees see having an HR person, whether it's outsourced or internal, is paramount because you cover so many different aspects. And yeah. if, if I think about, the reasons you know why obviously I'm a recruiter like those listening now you know it's people come to me where they're leaving a job it's typically because those things have not been prioritized there there's no well-being policy they're not having an onboard you know whether it's in in a new job as in the start yeah. job, or whether it's actually been promoted and they still haven't been onboarded into that promotion there's no yeah policy. there's so many different areas and I think it's about time really that it's a little bit like how recruiters are perceived it's about time yeah are is seen as an integral part of a business's strategy to not only propel and to grow but actually to retain talent as well yeah and, and I've seen that change um when I was you know in a what I call a proper job <laughs> um where you'd have people come into the business senior people come into the business who didn't really rate HR 
um you could see that and you could and you could um feel sort of the you know the, the, the way that they were with you um but over time they realized the importance and they could see that shift in the reliance on hr to help them build their teams and support their business because it is early it's all the same everyone's got the same goal the business want the business to be successful and to grow yep. and so hr is is a, is a part of making that happen yeah, definitely well that leads very nicely really to what i want to sort of ask you which is so a lot of our listeners who are leaders might not have a budget to actually take on a full-time hr person which again is why people like yourself you know are invaluable as a as a, an outsource you know you can actually plug in and be that outsource like i'm an outsource recruiter i suppose so as a starting point what what would you say the good the foundations are to have a good hr strategy in place what would you say those pillars would be so i think it all uh, evolves around your brand right and your employ your employee value proposition is is your brand so it's all i think that i always focus on on that as being the the main thing so looking at you know what remuneration you offer um not just salary you know everything else that you can offer to a business um benefits is that that's massive at the moment people are, are massively changing where they've never had benefits before and now needing to because that's people are asking that's what they're asking when they're coming on board or before, you know leaving because they're getting better benefits elsewhere and then obviously you've got your culture which is hugely important and something that you can't actually touch but by doing all the other things that you do with around, you know, your work environment, all the other things that I've just mentioned, your career development, your, your um, everything that you do for your people all comes back to your culture. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I just think it's so important to make sure, make sure not only have you got all that in place, through your, which I always talk about, your, your EVP, but also your policies, your procedures, everything, an employee handbook. You know, does that talk the way my language? Is that how my business works? Am I, am I have I got everything in place? So the, the 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 things that just tend to get thrown together don't actually flow very well. They're not in a very good style. So that's something that you always need to be looking at as well. But I think the key things um, to support a business are making sure that they're attracting and retaining the key talent. Yeah, and, and actually, you've, you've just you've, you've said something there that's just really triggered in my head, which is I think that we get a lot in our industry, particularly SMEs, a lot of accidental successful leaders. You know, yeah, absolutely. Do. And so their their skill set is rightfully so, you know, it's creating business development opportunities, it's incredible recruitment prowess, but what they then forget is all the intricacies of why people want to come and work in that business day to day. And so many times, and obviously I hear this from the other side, you, you hear it from one side, I hear it from the other side, which is why they're looking to potentially leave is that, you know, there's a lot of virtue signaling with some of the things you've said. So they might have these policies in place. They might have amazing benefits where, you know, you get to go for these lunch incentives. You might have people. Yeah. It, it, what matters, especially to Gen Z, is things yeah. like pension. Pension is really important. Yeah. You know, financial support, you know, buying a more, you know, buying a house, mortgage advice, but things like well-being. Yeah. It isn't about being bags anymore. I'm sorry. I think that yeah. we've moved on from that. But also things like maternity and paternity benefits. You know, people are thinking long yeah. career. So I think that I'm always very mindful that when we have conversations like this on our podcast, it's making sure if you are a leader listening, this isn't just about ticking a box. This is about a no. strategy, isn't it? So, so how do we ensure that we cut through that rhetoric and that it's, these things are actually being implemented and being done? If, if no HR. Well, this is why you need HR because they can, they can, and especially like my experiences in recruitment. So I know recruiters really well. I know what they like. I know what, what they need and and I know how they behave and 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 what attracts them to companies and it's it's having that expertise as well within the sector to be able to sit down with a business leader talk about what they're what they're currently doing and what we think that that you know what they need because they actually don't always know what they need they know what they want it to look like in the end but they don't know how they're going to get there so it's, I think having HR, whether it is that, so, I mean, small businesses can't, it's not, it's not viable to have an internal HR person. 
um, once you get to a certain size, like I've got a client that's scaled up over the last 18 months to a point where we've put an HR person in there now because they they, they need it internally. And they've seen the value of it as well, to be fair, for the things that we've done and how it's impacted on the business. Um, but small businesses don't need it, don't, don't want it. Um, but they can't afford it. But they do need all the things that go around it. Now, the, the business leaders can do that themselves, yes. but then that's taking them away from what they need to be doing. Yeah, no, and, and the thing is, is you know, I, I take my hat off to anybody that runs a sizable recruitment business, whether it's 10 people or 50 people, you have a lot of hats to, to wear. And I think, it, interestingly, for, for me, I've always thought that HR should be involved in interview processes, for example. Yeah. When I think about, you know, some of the most fluid relationships I've got there is somebody involved that's focusing on things like EVP and culture you know how yeah. you know we see these posts on LinkedIn all the time where you know somebody's interviewed it's a load of questions competency you know, it's not competency it's just you know how much money do you make you know why do you want to do this and that's it but actually you can really influence the right sort of people coming into a business because you I can say HR you have a very objective view of you know of the whole business you're not just looking at the money making side of, of a recruiter no you're looking at the behaviors as well you're looking at how they'll fit in you know to the team and and, and what ambitions they have and the other thing that i find um really interesting because i do a lot of interviews with and i don't recruit but i do interviews with my clients when they're bringing people on board it's it's what's my career progression what development plans am i have you got for me and you know, how how am I going to get from a um, associate recruiter to a principal recruiter, you know, and it's having those plans in place. It's not just saying, oh, there's a piece of paper that shows you how you can get from A to Z. But, but when they get in there, actually, there's nothing. No. And, and that's what we find a lot. So it's about making sure that when I'm interviewing, I'm saying to my clients, this is the type of things that they're asking for. These are the things that we need to make sure we're implementing. Um, if we haven't already got them in place. I love that. I love that you're giving that feedback for what the candidate needs as much as yeah. the employer, because I think that often gets forgotten. But I think it's also, you know, understanding behaviourally that they are the right person in the business. If, if, if this is a performance, I know we're good at months performance reviews, but also doing external interviews for new, new talent coming in. I think that yeah. there's a distinctive advantage of that, because so often, you know, if I, obviously we get, we're privy to, you know, probably the same information you're privy to actually you know that if you hit these milestones you're going to get moved into managing the thought but it's always a thing. And, and occasionally we see a, you know a plan where it's about behaviors as much as revenue and that i always think good because otherwise all you're creating is money making machines you're not creating collaboration you're not creating any future leadership skills if it's just all about money surely yeah and and that's where well, that is the, that's where you've got to move away from. It isn't all about the money. It's about everything else that links into making that, a, you know, a good employee and a successful employee. And you go, you talk about what you're saying before about, you know, all these great billers, the, the fantastic billers, they're making loads of money, they become leaders. And actually, they've had no development to get to that. And I remember when I first experienced this many, many years ago, a guy was, a, he was a massive recruit, massive biller, and then he's, the promoted him to a team leader. So from a Friday, he was a biller. Monday, he was a team leader. Everybody's looking at him differently. He didn't know what to do because he, he, he had no development at all. Um, and it, it was a car crash. So it was, it's then making sure that when you're bringing people on as, as a, in the career as leaders, that they're getting that development to get them to that point as well and behaviors are so important values are so important you know i when we do performance reviews i know we're going to come on to that but i always make sure there's a section in there about values and how are they displaying the company values and behaviors that are required so it's not just about the money it's about everything else that goes behind it and, and i think this could not be a better timed podcast actually because i think the narrative is changing thank god mm. that time too where we are talking about this certainly on linkedin which is obviously where we all live about hiring on values and not hiring on experience yeah. not hiring on education we're hiring on people's values because ultimately that is what makes them who they are yeah and i think and and again i think this is where from a mindset point of view a lot of recruitment leaders and you know i'm not being too generic but we have to be i guess 
you know, that's not necessarily what we've historically hired on. It's not been around, mm -hmm. you know, if I, if I sit in, you know, I'm, I'm a newbie in recruitment and I sit in front of recruitment, 10 recruitment leaders and I say, you know, so why do you want to work in recruitment? And I say, well, because I really want to help people. You know, I really want to get people on their, the right career path. And, you know, that's what it's about for me. And it's, it's watching their career develop over the next however many years. Nine out of 10 of those potentially will go, she's not money driven, not interested. But the one will go, wow, for her, it's all about doing the right thing. It's about values. And I think the narrative has changed. Would you agree on that? I do agree on that. And, I, and one thing that I always say to people that are coming into the recruitment sector is you are going to change somebody's life. When you place somebody, you are making their life better. And that, you can't, you, you can't explain that feeling and how great that feels. And, and it is, because it, 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 you can get sort of lost in the placements, 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 placements. I've got to get them candidates in. But actually, when you start building those relationships with your candidates and you start to see how you've changed their life, how you've developed their career and they've moved, it, you know, moved on and on because of you, that's a great feeling. Absolutely. I think it all weds together really nicely. We have mentioned this a couple of times, performance reviews, but I want to just set the scene because for me, since COVID, obviously, a large portion of our industry, thank goodness, has embraced the hybrid working environment, which you yeah. know, hybrid, you know, let's let's just be clear about that. That's where both employee and employer are happy with this relationship that they can, you know, come into the office on set days, work from home rest of the time, they're supported. But we do have a massive chasm, don't we? Of where people's performance reviews, one-to-ones, appraisals, whatever you want to call them, morning meetings, weekly meetings, they seem to have fallen off the planet. And actually, that's why the, I'm getting a lot of phone calls about people that are falling through the net here. So what, what, what have you seen as an external HR professional of why this is happening? And then what can we do to plug those gaps to ensure that companies aren't failing? So I've got lots of people when I've done exit interviews saying I've not had an appraisal since 2019 that was before COVID and when we first went into lockdown I was working with a client where we were implementing a performance review process into the business and we bear in mind when we first went to lockdown it was meant to be for three weeks <laughs> and this and he said to the, the CEO said to me but right, we're going to put that on hold now until we go back in the office and I said, no, 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 you know, you can't do that. We're halfway through this program. We're going to continue with it and we're going to do it on Zoom. And that was where a lot of companies fell down is they said, well, we're not do we won't do it now. We'll wait till we get back in the office, which we, you know, never really have fully to the, to the extent um, that's needed. But it's kind of gone off the radar, like, massively off the radar and the amount of people I speak to say I know we need to be doing them we just haven't got around to just bringing them back again and 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 that's what I do with a lot of my clients is make sure that we bring that back and and it's not just about having a, a one review at the end of the year I always call that the wrap up because you have like quarterly reviews throughout the year and you might have even if it's on zoom or face to face but you'll have like your, your, your regular catch-ups which you do talking about the business, where we at, what we're doing, but you don't have those all about you. It's all, you know, let's sit down and have a one-to-one -one just about you and talk about you. And that's what people are missing. And that's what they need back. And I can't tell you how many people I have spoken to in exit interviews that said, I don't get reviews anymore. Nobody talks to me about my development. I mean, I, I just, I, you know, if you listen to this and you're, you know, you, you, you're sort of guilty of this a little bit, would you cancel a Zoom or a Teams meeting with your biggest client? It's an hour in your diary, catch up with your client, you know, they're generating how much revenue for your business. You would never dream of saying, oh, we'll just, we'll bump it on to next week. Oh, we'll do it again. Yeah. We'll do it. I'm sorry, something else has come up. That's how you should regard your appraisals, your reviews, your internal meetings. Yeah. Because that so, should be non-negotiable. They should be in yeah. there and not move. That's the problem. And quite a lot of people do do it, to be fair. There are a lot that keep it, do that. But what I tend to find is, is with uh, managers is they find it, it's too admin heavy. So it's too time consuming. So the way that we change that process with them is make it half hour once a quarter or even once a month. Might be overkill sometimes, but definitely once a quarter yeah, and, and it's half an hour once a quarter and then your annual wrap up 
isn't an hour and a half to two hours and you've then got to write up all these notes. It's literally just wrapping up what you've talked about throughout the year. And so that's what, two hours in a year rather than, you know, once a year, two and a half hours. Yeah. Time. Where a lot, as we all know now, planning a year ahead, who knows what could happen? You just go, it's mm. a change and it is ever moving past. And, and I'm really pleased we brought that up because I think the same applies with induction so people starting new jobs there's been a dichotomy with you know what they're expecting to get when they start a new job and of course you know depending on where you are in your career you might be in the office a lot more you might be working hybrid or working from home but I think it's important that you know if this is the way the world is going to be now you know that that level of induction that level of importance again I yeah. know people that start new jobs and go well I never got my induction you know they were yeah thrown into it or yeah. start a new job within a job, you know, being promoted and never getting the full induction. Yeah, and I don't think you can you can underestimate the the value of having that. And I think onboarding starts from the minute somebody accepts the job. So from the minute they accept the job for that period before they join you is when you start. I did a webinar actually um, about eighteen months ago on virtual onboarding, and it was really interesting the feedback that I got that people hadn't thought about doing things like having. A team, I mean, this was on Zoom because that's where we were in that in that in that world, but having a team lunch on Zoom before this person starts, you know, and bringing them into and all these things to keep in contact so we get on board and then doing a proper onboarding program with them. And 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 I can honestly, I can tell you that I still do exit interviews with people that have, have left after two years and said, and I never got a proper induction when I started. And that can actually have a an effect on whether they stay or leave i know it sounds crazy yeah. but when they're thinking of leaving that's just another tick in the box and they never give me a proper induction when i joined and you know it's i just don't think people underestimate the value of it i totally agree with you and i think it, you, you're welcome to a business is is how you know that is how your the scene is set as far as i'm concerned that's the foundation for your career in a business so have you got any and we haven't prepared for this have you got any kind of three top tips for successfully inducting somebody whatever their level is if it is going to be hybrid I mean we'll we'll just assume that it's going to be hybrid what would your top tips be the top tips right so I would say it's um like I said earlier keep in contact with them from the minute they accept the job and make sure within 24 to 48 hours they get that offer because you don't want to leave them lingering and they're gonna get I haven't had my contract yet. You know, they've got that offer, they can resign and then they can start f focusing on you. So have keep that contact right throughout that period. And then also make sure that you plan an itinerary for when you onboard them from the day they start, the people they're going to meet, the things that they need to do and make sure they see that prior to joining you. So they've got, ah, oh, right, I know my first four weeks, this is what's going to be happening. Because everybody's nervous when they go and start a new job. So knowing what you're going into beforehand is important. So that's another key one. Um, obviously, the meetings and then just check ins, or regular check ins with them, making sure that they're OK. And a buddy. I always like to allocate a buddy if the, if the business has got enough staff to do that is make sure they have a go to person right from the minute they come on board. I love that. I think that's really, really val invaluable advice. And, you know, what you've basically said there is setting expectations, isn't it, from day one? Yeah. It's, it's actually quite simple, but so many people fail to do it because it all seems like a massive effort, but it's not. But that's why you need an outsource like Tina. It really is. So we've yeah. got, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge amount that we've covered there. And I can see why you're so invaluable to your clients and really grateful for you joining us today, Tina. Thank you so much for everything that you've said. Wow, that's flown by. Thank you. Enjoyed that. It's been brilliant. Thank you for joining us on the Recruiters Recruitment Podcast. Thank you.